on to our next story here. So yesterday was Super Tuesday. I have some interesting results to show you uh, in reference to how some of these states uh, voted for both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. And we're also going to take a look at that uncommitted slash no preference vote and how that actually uh, turned out in some of these states. But first and foremost, I want to start with this clip here. We're going to start off with Donald Trump, right? Because the mainstream media, the point that they are making after Super Tuesday is that Donald Trump does not have a, a solid hold or a stronghold on the Republican base because Nikki Haley was able to still pull some of the voters. Don't get me wrong. Nikki Haley didn't win any state except for Vermont and the district. She won the district of D.C. She won D.C. Uh, a couple days ago. But. Listen to how they frame this, because what they're trying to tell people is the fact that Nikki was still able to get any votes at all or the percentage that she got. They're saying that Trump actually does not have uh, a large base in the Republican Party. Tell me what you think about that. Listen to this. And then overall, just overall, when I look at the exit polls and um, particularly it was in uh, California, Virginia, North Carolina, around 35, 36 percent of Republicans, people voting in the Republican primary, saying they're not willing to uh, to guarantee that they will support the Republican nominee. You know, that tells me Trump still has a problem consolidating his support. And it's interesting because, you know, the if let's let's assume the New York Times poll from the other day was correct. That said that Trump was getting 93 percent of the vote that he had in 2020, yet still people voting, you know, somewhere between 20 and 40 percent of people voting in the Republican primary are not voting for him. So who are those people? Uh, you know, maybe they're independents, but they're people that are open to voting for Joe Biden. So I feel I'm coming out of this sort of primary season feeling more optimistic about Biden's room to grow and Trump hitting some kind of ceiling. <clears throat> Now, to me, that doesn't really make any sense. <laughs> and I don't even like Donald Trump, but to me, that doesn't really make any sense. You can look at the numbers for yourself, right? If you look on the screen here, because they're premiering results on the bottom here, even in Tennessee, that was 79% in, he got 77.4%. Nikki Haley was at 19.5% at that point in time. There is obviously a significant difference. <laughs> you know, And the look on her face just cracks me up. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense what you're talking about, boo. I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to convince the American people that Donald Trump actually doesn't have as much of a chance as people think that he does or as the polls say that he does. Uh, but the reality is he does have a chance and he does have a strong chance or there is a strong chance that he could win again and Joe Biden could lose. Not just also based on the numbers, but also based on the fact if you talk to people on the street, the number of people that said they're not going to vote for Joe Biden this time around, or they may be willing to vote for Donald Trump just based on the economy alone. I've heard that from multiple people. I showed you the poll last night, right? Where we looked at the numbers of African-American voters, where Donald Trump now has 23% of the African-American population for support. He went from 9% to 23%. So they're trying to put this message out there to make it seem like he's not as big of a threat as people think. But remember, they did that in 2016. They convinced people that there was no way that Donald Trump was going to be Hillary Clinton, and they were wrong. Jen, I have to I have to give you the opportunity to say California Senator Alex Padilla because Kevin DeLeon <laughs> oh, no. ran yes, for it but oh didn't get gosh, it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank yes. you so much, Senator Alex Padilla. Yes, I knew you would want to he say that was? and I wanted to give you a yes. chance before we got too yes. far down the road. Oh, that's um, so nice of you. <laughs> Claire, let me ask you about I mean the, the points that Jen was just making there in terms of the overall uh, strength of the general election candidates in the presidential tonight and what we're learning about that from these primaries. Hey, listen, I think the thing I take away from today is looking at the margins and deciding which party is really more united. In all the states that voted today, if you look at the results that we know right now, there was only two states where Biden won by less than 70, per 70 points. OK, everything else, 80 percent, 82 percent. You know how many states Donald Trump won by more than 70 points? One, Alabama. Pause for a second. Um, here's what Claire is leaving out, by the way. She was part of the Hillary Clinton team. 
You should know that when you hear what she's saying, right? Okay. So the majority of Americans don't vote in the primary. The majority of Americans don't vote in the primary. So the fact that she's also ignoring the number of uncommitted votes that did happen, I can tell you the majority of young voters don't show up to vote in the primary either. And it could be young voters that decide who the president will be in 2024. Let's remember how they heavily came out to support Barack Obama. And let's remember how they heavily came out to support Joe Biden in states like Georgia in 2020. So, of course, Joe Biden was going to get over 80 something percent when you actively suppress the candidates that were running against him in mainstream media. There was no debate. People who voted in the Democratic primary, a lot of these people didn't even know Marianne Williamson and Dean Phillips were running. She conveniently leaves that out. So there was no Democrat primary debate. There was a Republican debate, which Donald Trump wasn't even a part of. But people got to hear Nikki Haley over and over and over again through the debates. And she received a lot of coverage in mainstream media. Same with Dean Phillips. He kind of came out of nowhere. And did actually still did well for the fact that he came out of nowhere. I didn't even know who this guy was. So she's leaving that out. It is important that you, you give people that information. If there would have been debates for the Democrat candidates, I would argue that those people that were running against Joe Biden would have received a higher percentage. The reason why they didn't is because most people didn't even know they were running. And you talk to people, average people in the street, they'll tell you, I didn't even know these other people were running against Joe Biden. I heard it all the time. So Joe Biden's percentage, I would argue, would not be as high as it as it is if they would have had debates just like the Republican Party had debates. And if it wasn't for the media blackout against the candidates that were running against Joe Biden in the first damn place. Of course, she's going to leave that out. So there are more people voting against Donald Trump that are even thinking about voting against Joe Biden. And I get the uncommitted is sending a message, and I think it's one that needs to be heard. I think it's important for our party. But really, there is a Republican war going on behind the scenes. It's playing out in primaries all over the country tonight, where big money is going in against MAGA candidates. Uh, they have a problem in the Republican Party in terms of how unified they are. I don't think we have near as far to go. Well, let me just stop this for a second. We're going to go to the next clip. So first of all, Claire, you see the things they talk about? We're much more unified. If we're so unified, what's up with all these uncommitted votes? If we're unified, the Democratic Party isn't unified either. You have a progressive split from the status quo centrist, typical Democrats in the party. We're not united. If we were united, right? then you, you wouldn't have all those uncommitted votes. If the Democratic Party was united, over 100,000 people in Michigan wouldn't have voted uncommitted. I think people are going to be surprised in November. They're not talking to people on the ground. These are just a bunch of paid pundits to repeat State Department talking points. And I think people are really going to be surprised. Now we move on to Nikki Haley's support. And Nikki Haley has dropped out of the race. Let's see what happened here with Nikki Haley. You can see the states that have called now all red for former President Trump. The states that are too early to call. This one's interesting. I'm curious what Chuck's going to say about the state of Vermont. That one may be close. You heard Ali Vitale talking about Nikki Haley's hopes there. And then plenty more to come in the hour ahead. Tom, I'll take it back to you. Uh, Hallie, we appreciate that. Come on down here. Even though we have like 18 steady cams, we're going to share this one because we love <laughs> sharing everything. Chuck, uh, you got some, some great data in. And the, the key to winning a Republican primary is to get the most Republican votes. And you're finding and something don't, interesting. And we don't mean to be like yeah. snarky about that. But the point is this, right? And I wanted to put together, look, we're not exit polling every state. I wish we had the resources to do it. Right. But um, uh, we're, we're happy if somebody wants to pay us um, to exit poll most states. But I, we have all the, every place we've exit polled. Yeah. Here are four key primary states that we've exit polled, okay? So you got New Hampshire, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia. These percentages you're looking here, this is Haley, Nikki Haley's percentage of Republican support so this, I wanted you to see this because this goes by what I've been saying all along. 
She did not have strong support from the Republican Party. That's why she dropped out. This is why she had to drop out. Nikki Haley was propped up by some Democrats and she was propped up more so by independents, but she never had the strong base of the Republican Party. Now, the question is for the people who voted for Nikki Haley in the primary, where are those voters going to go in the general? I would argue, I think some of them are still going to end up voting for Donald Trump and some of them may stay home. Something to think about there. But that's the other piece that Claire was leaving out. Some of these, some of these voters that voted for Nikki Haley in the primary, some of these people come the general election, they're going to go ahead and vote for Donald Trump because some of the people may be party loyalists where they vote for the Republican candidate, regardless of who the candidate is in the end. Claire is leaving that out. In these four states, registered Republicans, actually either self-described yeah. or registered Republicans. And as you can see here, her home state of South Carolina, her high water mark right. has been 30 percent. At best, she's she's not getting she only got 25 percent of actual Republicans in New Hampshire coming up short in Virginia. Look at this below double digits, uh, excuse me, below 20 percent there. Now, we have her percentage where obviously where she gets her strength is among non-Republicans. Right. This is her percentage among people that are unaligned or not, won't call themselves a Republican. Obviously, again, our home state, she did best among those voters of 62. But these numbers needed to but be it's 75, 80. And yeah. it's not trending higher. It's right? not. And here's something else to think. Yeah. No, it's not trending higher. And so notice how they're talking about Nikki Haley, right? They're talking about Nikki Haley almost as though they were rooting for Nikki Haley. Now, this is MSNBC. This is the liberal uh, news media, right? But notice how they're talking about her. CNN has been doing the same thing. These people were actually secretly rooting for Nikki Haley. And that goes to show you once again, when it comes between the two parties, they're not really caring about the difference of the, the Democrat or Republican either. They just want someone in that status quo. That's that's all they want to happen. About here. And, and it's just, look, we're watching tonight and we're talking about Vermont mm -hmm. because it's close. OK. All right. She's a leading deep, right now blue state. in yeah. one state in Massachusetts. We can go ahead and pull it up. She is leading right now in Massachusetts. OK, this is the only state of all of the ones that we're covering that she's leading in right now. And then there's only one other state. OK, I want to remind people of the New Hampshire results. Here are the New Hampshire results. Right. OK, here was Nikki Haley number 43 percent. That was her New Hampshire number. OK, right now in Vermont, she's over 43, sitting at 47. And in Massachusetts, she's sitting at 50. Yeah, there is not. Those numbers did not hold. <laughs> I just want to go ahead and tell you that part. She did win a uh, Vermont, which Vermont is a quirky kind of state. You know, that's that's Bernie state. She did win uh, Vermont. But I think some of these voters that voted for Nikki, too, may end up voting for RFK Jr. If he's on the ballot in their state. But Nikki Haley did obviously drop out. She won Vermont, she won DC, but I think we all saw this coming. So here is Nikki here. In all likelihood, Donald Trump will be the Republican nominee when our party convention meets in July. I congratulate him and wish him well. I wish anyone well who would be America's president. Our country is too precious to let our differences divide us. I have always been a conservative Republican and always supported the Republican nominee. But on this question, as she did on so many others, Margaret Thatcher provided some good advice when she said, quote, never just follow the crowd, always make up your own mind. So here she is quoting <laughs> Margaret Thatcher of all people. Ay, ay, ay. It is now up to Donald Trump to earn the votes of those in our party and beyond it who did not support him. And I hope he does that. At its best, politics is about bringing people into your cause, not turning them away. And our conservative cause badly needs more people. This is now his time for choosing. I end my campaign with the same words I began it from the book of Joshua. I direct them to all Americans, but especially to so many of the women and girls out there who put their faith in our campaign. I don't think Joshua would be feeling you like that, Nikki. <laughs> it's 
always funny to me when people want to bring up uh, scripture or, you know, books from the Bible. And I grew up in the church, so I'm very familiar. But it's always funny to me because I'm like, I don't think uh, Joshua <laughs> would approve of uh, <laughs> your politics, son. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For God will be with you wherever you go. In this campaign, I have seen our country's greatness from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, America. God bless you. And just like that, Nikki is gone. Um, and what's interesting, notice Nikki Haley did not say whether or not she would get behind Donald Trump uh, and support him. She has yet to make a decision on that. Uh, so it will be really interesting. It makes you wonder what's going to happen there. Now we're gonna move over to what happened with the Democratic Party. Now this happened in 2020 and it happened again this year. Joe Biden once again has lost the American Samoa Democratic Caucus. So I don't know if everyone remembers this, but in 2020, it was actually uh, Michael Bloomberg won the American Samoa, uh, Joe Biden did not. And this happened again. I've never been to the American Samoa, so I don't know what's up. Oh, by the way, Kirsten Sinema also uh, is Dunzo. I don't know if everybody heard about that. Um, what's wrong with the Hill? Their site is always wonky. Go away, Kirsten Sinema. I'm trying to get away from you. Um, hold on, let me come back out and go back in. Eric, can you? Oh, can I get, get rid of that? Okay. All right. Yeah, they, I don't know why they put those videos at the top. Like, I can't just go away. Okay, here we go. President Biden was projected to lose the Democratic caucus in American Samoa to an obscure candidate in a surprising result that comes amid a string of Super Tuesday wins. It goes on to say Democrat Jason Palmer, an entrepreneur running a long shot bid against the incumbent, was projected to win the U.S. territory's Democratic race. Palmer has reportedly qualified for the presidential ballot in just 16 states and territories, according to a release from the campaign through PR Newswire. Palmer notably campaigned in the territory. So this was news to me. I didn't know this guy was running. Did you? So Joe Biden did not win uh, the American Samoa just as before. And something else happened. I want to show you what happened here in Massachusetts. I want to make sure I'm going to the Democrat. Yeah, we'll show both of them. I want to prove a point. When we talk about that uncommitted vote, well, let me get a little bit bigger. Yeah. Look at what happened here in Massachusetts, my state. So again, you see Trump and Nikki, Trump got 59.7%, Nikki got 36.7%. But what I want you to focus on is no preference. So in Massachusetts, we didn't have uncommitted, we had no preference. Same thing, same cause. However, on the Republican side, 5,615 people voted no preference. Now that's not a lot uh, considering the number of registered voters in uh, Massachusetts. However, what it goes to show you is that even on the Republican side, there were people voting against, you know, or, or voting against the genocide. Now I want to show you the Democrat results here. So in Massachusetts, Joe Biden won by like 81.4%, but look what came in second place. No preference. Over 59,163 people in Massachusetts voted no preference, voting against the genocide. That's 9.2%. Now, somebody do some math for me in the chat. I know we got math whiz out there somewhere. Take 59,163 and add that to, where did it go? 5,615, and we should come up with a total over 60,000 something. Then there's more. Over 29,000 people in Massachusetts voted for Dean Phillips. We can view all candidates. Over 20,000 voted for Marianne Williamson, and over 11,492 were write-ins. So 
don't get me wrong. Massachusetts, for the most part, is a blue state. Right. Will still be blue. It just is what it is. But. You know, it just. The fact that you had between Dean and Marianne, that's over 49,000 people that voted for the other candidates and not Joe Biden. Then you have 59,000 that voted no preference. We're coming up on over 100,000. Now, some of these people that voted for Dean and Marianne in the end are Democrat loyalists. And in the end, they'll end up supporting Joe Biden. I already know how this works. Not sure about the write-ins. Those people might stay home. But some of these people that voted no preference might just stay home. So it'll be interesting to see what happened. But I wanted you to see that, ladies and gentlemen, that on the Republican side and the Democrat side, there were voters voting against the genocide by choosing to vote no preference. And I want to show you how the other states panned out in reference to the uncommitted or no preference votes. Check this out, peeps. You guys realize in North Carolina, over 85,000 people voted uncommitted. That's 12.6%. In Minnesota, this is going to be one to watch, by the way. This is going to be a telling one. And I'll give you more information about that in a second. In Minnesota, over 40,450 people voted uncommitted 19.3% in Minnesota, Colorado, 36,799, 7.4%, Alabama, 10,000, over 10,000, 6%, Iowa, over 480, 4%, Massachusetts, over 35,000, actually it's more than that. This might've been when he um, first saw it, but Massachusetts was actually higher than that. Um, and Tennessee over 10,000. The point that I'm trying to make here, folks, is this. Come the general election, these people are either going to do one or two things. They're either going to stay home or I think they're going to vote third party or independent. If people like Jill Stein, RFK Jr. and, well, maybe not RFK Jr. because his Israel views, they probably won't pick him. But if people like Jill Stein and Cornell West can pull away from this group, that could be a game changer, son. That could be a game changer. He said, uncommitted slash no preference did better than Dean Phillips or Marianne Williamson whenever on the ballot. What does that tell you? Shout out to Karim for those uh, numbers there. Now, the question then comes, as I mentioned, what happens to those people come the general election where they're freaking out about this already? Shout out to Case Study QB for this clip discussing some of the Super Tuesday uncommitted vote and its consequence in the general election. Listen to this. That's healing that has to be done. Now, are progressives going to vote for Donald Trump? I would say 99 0.9% of the cases, probably not. But we yeah. talked about this a bit earlier. If you stay home or you vote third party, you know, especially in a close battleground state, and I don't know that Minnesota will be one, uh, but Michigan will be, Wisconsin will be, Pennsylvania will be, uh, Georgia will be, Arizona will be, Nevada will be, and potentially, you know, throw in North Carolina, Virginia, or Minnesota in there if that's where we end up come October, November. Uh, in a battleground state, you worry. Uh, you worry. Colorado used to be a battleground state. It has trended blue. Uh, you might say, oh, 85 to 7, whoop de doo uh, This is the primary. Uh, those are your voters. You need right. them in November. That's healing. That has Check this out, folks. And actually, this, was, this wasn't the full total, but at that point in time, it was 18.1% that voted uncommitted in Minnesota. So peep this, folks. He says that's healing that needs to be done. And he uses a scare tactic. What's going to happen to those people if they're, they're not going to vote for Trump? And it was really interesting. He said, you know, these progressives aren't going to vote for Donald Trump. First of all, he's assuming that all those people that voted uncommitted are progressive. They're not. I just showed you conservatives that voted uncommitted. Not everybody who voted uncommitted or no preference in the Democratic Party is a progressive. I think that's a mistake 
for mainstream media to assume. If they actually were on the ground and they talked to some of the voters, they would know that. And then we bring in Chuck Todd. Now they're like, what's going to happen? What about the third party candidates? Should we be afraid? Case study QB here is doing the damn thing again. I told you they're freaking out because they know. You have Cornell West uh, on the ballot here and Jill Stein on the ballot in these two states. Then I buy that Gaza could be a real problem. Mm. But if they're not on the ballot, then where does that protest go? Then there's the RFK thing. Look, I think. Pause for a second. You heard what he said? If they're on the ballot, I'd be worried about the protest vote, the Gaza thing. But if they're not on the ballot, notice how he said that? First of all, Chuck needs to do some research. Jill will be on the ballot because she's running through the Green Party. I can't speak for everybody else. But the Green Party, do you guys realize Jill Stein was on the ballot in over 40, I think it was over 45 states when she ran in 2016. And she's picking up state after state after state. I see it every day on social media. You think Jill Stein won't be on the ballot in Minnesota? <laughs> Are they serious? You think Jill Stein won't be on the ballot in Michigan? Are we serious? She'll be on there. I know the Green Party will be. I don't know about everybody else, but he's hoping that they won't be on the ballot. Then where does that protest go? Then there's the RFK thing. Look, I think RFK, it's pretty clear to me the polling shows it, it hurts Trump as much as it hurts Biden. So I don't know if RFK is the same. But to me, having those liberal third party candidates, if they're on the ballot in those two states, that's real trouble for Biden. And I just see the bigger picture is what you see it in poll after poll. When is the last time you had an election where there was this little enthusiasm for both candidates? I know 16 was high. This looks even higher. You have Cornell West. Uh, so he's talking about these states. He's talking about the Minnesota, right? And he's talking about uh, Michigan. Uh, Jill will be on the, I can guarantee, I'm telling you, Jill's probably going to be on the ballot in Michigan. She was on the Michigan uh, ballot in Michigan before. She's actually, uh, Rome from RBN is actually going to be meeting with Jill tonight. She's out there in Dearborn, Michigan right now. Michigan, remember, Jill actually does pretty well in Michigan if we go back to 2016. And that was before the war in Gaza. So imagine how well she might do this time around. Remember, we've already had both Biden and Donald Trump as presidents, so they can't use that fear mongering again. They're trying to, but I don't think it's going to work this time. Then there brings up the issue here of the Senate race. We'll go to the one in California. Of course, Adam Schiff did win the Senate seat. Uh, against Katie Porter and against uh, Barbara Lee. He also had a lot of big money behind him, of course. But Adam Schiff didn't really have a good time uh, with his acceptance speech here because protesters showed up and showed out against him. One of the <laughs> I... I want to thank you all. Someone came up and said to Adam Schiff, who was reading off a prompter, who was trying to stick to the prompter to wrap it up, he went and finished it up. These were people who came in about five or six to start with and said, ceasefire now, ceasefire now. Security ushered them out. And then another couple popped up, let Gaza live, let Gaza live. And then some more came in the middle. But security could not get them out, that they were scattered through the room here at the Avalon Theater and the nightclub. We'll go down there and pull down to the crowd for me, please. And you see that, you know, there's just a lot of arguing, a lot of disagreement. Again, they were, they were chanting, free Gaza now, let Gaza live, cease fire now, let Gaza live. And the protesters remain here in the center of this floor. So what was supposed to be a victory celebration and a scripted speech that Adam Schiff was reading off prompter, one no doubt he had carefully crafted a long time ago, was cut dramatically short and he was now taken off the stage <laughs> i wanted you guys to see that because he was actually taken off the stage and he's like what was supposed to be a celebration why should they get to celebrate when people are dying in gaza and they are actively funding and approving the legislation to give israel more weapons no 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 celebration no 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 
Elizabeth Warren was approached when she was at dinner and some people said, I feel like that's a step too far. She's just trying to have a dinner with her husband. No, 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 no rest for the wicked. There ain't no rest for the wicked. None. I don't care if you're at dinner. I don't care if you're playing basketball. I don't care if you're trying to swim. I don't care if you're skateboarding. I don't care if you're chilling on the beach. No rest for the wicked. Now there's another part of this protest as well. I want you to see it from a different angle so you can actually see him uh, on the stage because there were different angles of this as well. Again, Adam Schiff did not get a chance <laughs> to finish his speech. My wife Eve is here tonight. Um, this is my wife Eve. So lucky to live in a democracy where we all have the right to protest. We are so lucky to live in that kind of democracy, and we want to make sure that we keep this kind of democracy. Uh, yeah, so he won, but they made it so that he would not be able to finish that speech. So Adam Schiff did end up uh, leaving the stage. And I, I absolutely love it. He should not be able to celebrate while you're aiding, you know, this genocide against uh, the people. Max Blumenthal uh, actually called out something about Adam Schiff as well. He called him Adam Schiff. <laughs> Look at this. Raytheon Pack cordially invites you to join Congressman Adam Schiff, California 28th District, for a concert featuring Beyonce. So for some of you who are probably wondering where does Beyonce stand on this issue because people like her and Taylor Swift have been silent about the genocide, I think you got your answer, boo. Beyonce gonna follow the money, the money that goes to her. Concert featuring Beyonce. You see this? It was Wednesday, December 18th. Uh, oh, it was Wednesday, December 18th, 2013. Verizon Center, and that was in DC. And look at this, suggested contributions $2,500 for a ticket, two tickets, four, $4,000. Checks made payable to Adam Schiff for Congress. Reply card enclosed or to RSVP, contact Mary Palmer, yada, yada, or email. It is just, you know, it, it just, so he put this over that so people could see who he was funded by, Raytheon. Right. So again, he backs the military industrial complex and apparently Beyonce just went along with this, too, because she's like, I'm just trying to get paid. Right. And he actually retweeted this on top of this tweet. Christopher said Adam Schiff's entire victory speech tonight was interrupted by protesters chanting cease fire now. So the point that Max is trying to make is that Adam Schiff is in bed with the military industrial complex. We can go to part two with tight VNC, Eric, whenever you're ready. So it's it's very revealing, ladies and gentlemen. You see where the money is coming from. You see, you know, what's what's happening here. And I, I just think if I were people need to keep an eye on Minnesota. I told you it wasn't just Michigan. And we'll have to wait for Pennsylvania too. Because Pennsylvania is another one that's running an abandoned Biden uh campaign. <laughs> 